Adula, you're on mute if you are presenting. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, sorry, a technical error. Um, I was on mute. Uh, let me take two steps back. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. This is lecture two of the CSA Level 1 umpiring course hosted by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Abdullah Steenkamp, and my co-presenter for this evening is Tom Mokarosi. I will kick off proceedings this evening um, and we'll be covering laws five, six, seven, and eight. And I will then hand over to Tom, who will do laws nine, 10, and 11. And then we will open the floor for Q&A. So the first law that I'm covering is the bat. So the bat consists of two parts. It's a handle and a blade. So when it comes to the handle, the law tells us that the handle can be made of cane or wood or even both. And the handle is that part of the bat, only outside the blade, and is defined to be the upper portion of the handle. The law also allows for the handle to be covered with a grip. The second part of uh, is the blade. So when it comes to the blade, the blade is now the rest of the bat apart from the handle. And the law is clear here that the, the blade shall only consist of wood, whereas the, the handle can be, uh, can be cane or wood or both. The law is clear when it comes to the blade, only of wood. Uh, this law change was, uh, was done in, in 1979 where the law was not specific, where it did not state that the blade shall only consist of wood. And what happened in 1979, Dennis Lilly came out to bat with an aluminium bat. At that stage, it was uh, legal. Just knowing the law did it say your bat needs to be um, wood. And subsequent to that test match, the lawmakers uh, uh, made a change to the law and they've inserted that when it comes to the comes to the blade, it shall only consist of wood. When it comes to damage to the ball, the law allows that your bat can be covered. But the important thing of the covering is that it shall not cause unacceptable damage to the bat. So the law allows for uh, for uh, a covering uh, like uh, batting tape to be used, as long as that the tape or the covering that are used does not cause unacceptable damage. The law also gives us a definition of unacceptable damage, where it, it says that uh, unacceptable damage is any change that is greater than the normal wear and tear that is caused by the ball striking the wooden surface of the blade. When it comes to contact with the ball, so the law tells us that contact between the ball and any part of the bat, whether it's the blade, whether it's the, the handle, whether it's the grip, you'll find uh, some uh, bat, um, batsmen or batters put um, additional material on it, and we'll cover that in bullet point four. Any part of the bat, if the ball touches it, it will the the ball the ball will have made contact with the bat. So it tells us the bat itself, handle and blade, the batter's hand holding the bat. So any part of the batter's hand, and the important part here is it needs to be that hand that's holding the bat. Also, any part of the glove worn by the batter, but it needs to be the glove on the batter's hand that is holding the bat. And also, any additional, additional materials like um, some batters like putting on a toe guard 
um, the patting tape I referred to in the in the previous slide, those are additional uh, materials. So if the ball makes contact with any of these four bullet points, according to the law, it shall be regarded as the ball striking or touching the bat for the court law or for the LBW law or for scoring runs. So the important thing that I want you to take away from here is the whole of the bat, and it needs to be the batter's hand holding the bat or the, the touching the glove worn by the batter's hand holding the bat. If the ball makes contact with the hand that is not holding the bat, that, yeah, that is seen by the law as then part of the batter's person. So in an example, if the ball makes contact with, a, uh, with um, the hand or the glove not holding the bat and it, and it ricochets to first slip and first slip catches it before touching the, the ground, according to the law, that shall be not out. And the reason is the hand was not holding the bat at the time. When we come to bat size limits, Let's see what the law tells us. Firstly, when it comes to the overall length of the bat, all the law tells us is it shall not be more than 96.52 centimeters. It can be less. The law just tell us not more than 96.52 centimeters. You see this text is highlighted in green, so there is an exam question on this particular uh, text. The blade of the bat shall not exceed the following dimensions. When it comes to the width of the bat, it shall not be more than 10.8 centimeters. So for many years, there were only two size limits to the bat, according to the law. They, they said shall not be more than 96.52 centimeters. And then when it comes to the width, shall not be more than 10.8 centimeters. For many a year, this was all that the law uh, um, had when it comes to bat size limits. What manufacturers then uh, did was, seeing that there's only, uh, there's, uh, there's only uh, limits on the width and the, the length. So what they did was, the, the depth of the bat, you would find if you, if you um, about five, Ten years ago, if you see bats of Chris Scale, David Warner, you'd see the thickness, though they would have heavy and thick bats. And the reason was there was no limitations on the thickness of, of the bat. You'd see some bats have huge uh, edges. Again, there was no, nothing in the law that prohibits or uh, that said to us how big these edges should be, how, how thick the bat should be. What the lawmakers then did was a few years ago, they decided to just to make it an even contest between a bat and ball because because of these thick edges, uh, uh, thick bats, uh, you can half hit the ball and you would go for six. They decided it's not fair towards the bowlers. So they brought in the following. They said that the depth of the bat should not be more than 6.7 centimeters. And edges must not be more than four centimeters. So these two additional size limits was brought in just to even up the game or make it an even contest between a uh, bat and a ball. Just as we have a ball gauge, which we, uh, which I showed you a picture of on 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 Monday, we also have bat gauges to check the size limits of the bat. And here's an example of a bat gauge. So uh, what you do is at, um, so these bat gauges are currently just available at provincial level and in international level. So what we do is uh, at provincial level, at international level, we do uh, kit inspections uh, before the game starts. So we, we have a look at the pads, the gloves, and we'll look at the dimensions of the bat. So we will use this bat gauge. 
if the bat goes through the the bat gate, it is a legal bat. If it does not go through the bat gate, then that bat is illegal or does not comply to the size limits as per the law. The pitch. Firstly, the law tells us when it comes to the length of the pitch, it shall be 20.12 meters in length or 22 yards. Can, um, in the exam, they will accept both. Um, can use the imperial um, system or the, the metric system. I prefer using the metric system. These days, the, uh, the measuring tapes are, are, um, uh, are metric. So for me, it's much, much easier to use the metric system. So 20.12 meters in length uh, or 22 yards. And the width of the match pitch is 3.05 meters. That's metric. Imperial is 10 feet. So where do we measure it from? We will get to the creases in the next law. So uh, the two white lines on, on the left and on the right hand side of the, the picture, they are called bowling uh, creases. And you measure the 20.12 meters from the back edge of the bowling crease on the one side till the back edge of the bowling crease on the other side. If you should look at the, the, the yellow arrows, you will see the, uh, the arrow pointing to the back edge of the bowling crease on the one side to the back edge of the bowling crease on the other side, and that is 20.12 meters. When it comes to the selection and the preparation of the match pitch. So before the game, the ground authority, they shall be responsible for selecting the pitch and preparing uh, the pitch. So whatever preparation goes into, into the pitch and the selection before the game starts, it is up to the ground authority. They select and prepare. But once the game starts, once that toss takes place, the umpires, they are then in control of the use and the maintenance of the pits. We will uh, get um, later this evening, Tom will handle, we'll see in uh, law nine, we will speak of the, um, the maintenance of the pits. Are you allowed to change the pits once the game has started? Let's see what the law tells us. The law say, yes, you are allowed to change the pits once the match has started. But there are criteria that you need to take into account. Firstly, you need to decide, and when I say you, the umpires needs to decide. Both umpires needs to decide that the pitch is dangerous or unreasonable for play to continue on it. That's the first thing that needs to be in place. If the umpires decided that the game is not started and if the pitch has now become dangerous or unreasonable, then that's the first uh, criteria that needs to be in place. And the second one before you uh, can change the match pitch is you need the consent of both captains. If both captains agree, so firstly the umpires need to decide, yes, this pitch has now become dangerous or unreasonable. And if then the, the two umpires needs to go to both captains saying, captains, according to us, the speech is dangerous or un unreasonable for play to continue. Are you happy that we change the pitch? If both cap captains say yes, we can then change the pitch. If only one uh, um, say yes, then you're not allowed to change the pitch. You need consent of both captains. When it comes to junior cricket, so the governing body for cricket in the country, they shall decide, determine 
the length of the pitch for junior cricket. So when it comes to um, the length, which we discussed in the previous slide, which I said the length is 20.12 meters, that's uh, the metric length for pitches, that is for uh, men's, ladies, uh, as well as boys under 19 uh, up until 15. But when you go to under 13 and lower, that's junior cricket, the governing body of cricket in the country, they decide how long the pitch for junior cricket should be. The creases. There is an exam question um, on this. So they will definitely ask you the creases. They will ask you the name names of the creases and there will be a uh, length of certain creases that they will ask you. So pay attention. Creases will be examined. So for many years, I mean, I played the game at uh, at club level for more than uh, 20 years and you wouldn't believe it. I never knew these lines uh, had names. I used to call them creases. They, uh, whether it's the, the front line, the back line, the side lines, they were all creases to me. It's only once I became an umpire and did the level one course did I actually hear that these lines actually has names. And we're going to go through these names now. Uh, this is a picture of um, the, the JB Marks Oval in uh, Potterstrom, uh, South Africa. It is uh, one of the provincial grounds where the Northwest uh, Dragons play the provincial cricket. They, they uh, is one of the Division One teams in the Cricket South Africa uh, setup. So, creases, they do have names. And what are the names of, of the creases? The front line, it's called the popping crease. This is the popping crease. The back line, this is, or the back crease, this is called the bowling crease. And the, the other uh, crease is called return creases. There are two of them, one on this side and one on the other side. Uh, this is just one end of, of the pitch. There's a mirror image on the other on the other side, which is exactly the same and the same dimensions. dimensions. So just to confirm again, the name of the creases, the popping crease, the bowling crease and the return creases. In the next slide, we will go into more detail and I'll show you exactly the names and we will also go through the measurement of these, these creases. If we look at the picture and we'll uh, start from uh, right to left. So on the right hand side, you can see the name of the creases. So we will start with the front crease. That is called the popping crease. You also see the bowling, the bowling crease. And the bowling crease is where the stumps uh, or the wickets are pitched in. And then the two side creases, there are two of them and they are called return creases. Again, there is an exam question on this. They're going to ask you the name of the creases. So you need to study uh, this particular uh, diagram. It is at, uh, at the back of your law book and it's, it's also in the, the slides that uh, we provided. So just to confirm again, there are three creases. Popping crease, that's the front one. Bowling crease is where the stumps uh, are pitched in. And there are two return creases on the side. So now we know the names of the creases. So what are the measurements of these creases? So the law tells us firstly that the popping crease, the measurement of the popping crease is 3.66 meters. If I go back one slide, so the front crease, we now know it's got a name and its, it's name is the popping crease. And the law just tell us that the minimum length of the return of the popping crease should be 3.66 meters. 
They only the law only tell us um, the minimum length. The pop increase can be longer. Actually, the pop increase can go right up at all the boundary if uh, uh, if you want. But you hardly see it go up at all the boundary. It usually just go uh, go about um, eight to ten meters to the right and eight to ten meters to the left, especially. In televised games, uh, we better sometimes do run a bit wide, so you see that the pop increase is much longer in in televised games, just to assist the TV umpire if a batter runs wide to be able to to see where the line is and when the the wicket is uh, is put down. But all the law tell us when it comes to the pop increase, the minimum length of the pop increase should be. 3.66 meters. If it's five, if it's five meters, no problem. If it's ten, if it's fifteen meters, if it's twenty meters, no issue. All the law tell us minimum 3.66 meters. The, the two return creases. The law tell us that the return crease should be a minimum of 2.44 meters. Again. You see there are two return creases, one on the left, one on the right. All the law tells us is the minimum should be 2.44 meters. It can go right up until the boundary. If you want the return crease to be 5 meters, 10 meters, 50 meters, and no issue. All the law tells us is the minimum length should be 2.44 meters. And under the noble law, we will see the importance of the return crease because uh, it plays an important role when it comes to uh, the back foot and when it comes to the noble law. But we will get there in uh, a future lecture. So minimum length of the return crease, 2.44 meters. Same uh, on both sides. When it comes to the bowling crease, and this is the crease where the stumps are uh, pitched in, the length of the bowling crease is 2.64 meters. Again, I'm focusing on the metric system today. Most of the, the measuring tools, measuring tapes is in, uh, in metric. So uh, in the exam, if you, if you do want to put the, the money, the length of the bowling crease, if you put eight, eight feet, eight inches, you'll still get um, uh, full marks. The same with the popping crease. You can either put 3.66 meters or 12 feet. But again, I prefer the metric system. The, the length of the bowling crease, 2.64 meters. And this length is an exact length. And why is it an exact length? Because it gets measured from the return crease on the one side to the return crease on the other side. Once I've gone through the, 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 uh, the measurements, I will also show you exactly where to measure from. It's important that you do know exactly where to measure from. Do you measure from the, the back uh, the back of the line, the front line, in the middle of the line? We will go, go through that. But for now, just to go um, over the measurements again. Pop increase, minimum length, 3.66 meters. There are two return creases. Minimum length, 2.44 meters. Bowling crease. This is an exact length because it gets measured from the one return crease uh, to the other return crease. And the exact length for the bowling crease is 2.64 meters. It's another important uh, measurement that we need to take into account is the measurement from the bowling crease up until the return, up until the popping crease. And that measurement must be 1.22 meters. So the, so the measurement from the bowling crease up until the popping crease is 1.22 meters. Also, the stumps needs to be 22.86 uh, centimeters. We'll get to um, the wickets in the next uh, law, but 22.86 centimeters, that should be the width of the stumps. So just to uh, 
again confirm the measurements. Bowl increase, an exact measurement of 2.64 meters. Return increases, minimum of 2.44. Pop increase, minimum of 3.66 uh, meters. And the measurement from the bowl increase to the pop increase is 1.22 uh, meters. So where do you measure from? This is important that you do know exactly where to measure from. You measure from the back line, the front line, the middle. So when it comes to uh, measuring the um, the width of from the bowl increase till the pop increase, you put your the end of your measuring tape on the back edge of the bowl increase, exactly where the arrow e is on the back edge. That's where you put the point of your measuring tape. And from the back edge of the bowl increase until the back edge of the pop increase, not the front edge of the pop increase, the back edge of the pop increase, that should be 1.22 meters. Back edge of the popping of the bowl increase till the back edge of the pop increase, that measurement should be 1.22 to 1.22 uh, meters. When it comes to the measurement of the bowl increase, we know it's 2.64 meters. Again, the inside edge of the return crease, not the outside edge, the, this line here, the inside edge of the return crease on the one side, up until the inside edge of the return crease on the other side. That should be 2.64. Uh, meters. For me, uh, easy way to to memorize uh, the, these measurements. I only need to memorize the the one measurement, we, uh, the one point two two meters, which is from the back edge of the bowl increase till the back edge of the pop increase. That's one point two two meters. If you look at the measurement of the return crease, it's two point four four meters. Can you see this? Uh, there is a relationship between 1.22 meters and 2.44. It is exactly double. So if you take 1.22 meters and you double it, you get to 2.44 meters. Just look at the measurement of the pop increase, 3.66 meters. Again, there's a relation. If you take 1.22 meters and you multiply it by three, you get 3.66 meters. That is just my way of, I uh, just memorized the one measurement, which is 1.22 meters. And to get to the return increase, I times it by two. And to get to the pop increase, I times it by uh, three to get uh, those uh, those measurements. Also, and just an uh, exam tip, and we'll, we'll cover this in the revision lecture as well, uh, that when you do get a diagram uh, in the exam, it's important that you look at the arrows. If the arrows ask you for the length of the bowl increase, you need to look. It, does the arrow show it from the, uh, the inside edge of the return crease right up until the inside edge of the return crease on the other side? If that, if that is the case, they want the full length of the bowl increase, which is 2.64 meters. But if the arrows only show you from the middle stump up until the inside edge of the return crease on this side. So what that means is they're actually only looking for half of the measurement of the bowl increase and not the full measurement. So the tip is look at the arrow. If it's if it's from the inside edge of the bowling, the return crease on the one side up until the inside edge of the return crease on the other side, they are looking for the full length of the bowling crease, 2.64 meters. If the arrow only shows from the middle stump up until the inside edge of the return crease on the one side, they're only looking for half of the measurement, which is 1.32 meters. Excuse me, the same applies for the, the pop increase. Look at the arrow. Do they want, do they, uh, they show a full arrow or does the arrow only go from the, the, the middle stump um, to the other side? So that is just an exam tip.
Again, this is an exam. Study this diagram. Know your creases. Know your 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 measurements. It is something that you do every weekend. Uh, remember, on Monday we spoke about umpires needs to be at the ground at least forty five minutes before, before play start. This is one of the important duties that the umpires needs to to check are. Uh, the creases there are the correctly uh, measured. You actually go physically with your measuring tape and you measure all the creases. The wickets, the law tell us that the wickets, the length is 71.12 centimeters and it's and it's measured from the, you'll see the bottom part or the pointy part that will be in in the ground. So the 71.12 centimeters will be from where the arrow, uh, uh, the top of the arrow here at the bottom, right until the top, that is 71.12 centimeters. And when it comes to the, the width of the pitch of the wickets, it is 22.86 centimeters. When it comes to the bales, the law just guides us and say when the bales uh, in position at the top of the stumps, they not to project more than 1.27 centimeters above. And you don't need, you shouldn't be forcing the bales in, they should fit uh, perfectly onto the stumps. The law also allow for devices uh, aimed at uh, uh, protecting player safety. Um, I haven't uh, seen one, but the law allows it for um, um, for a piece of string to be tied um, to the bales. So if the bales gets dislodged, they um, by the let's say the 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 striker gets bowled and there is the string on it, the bale will uh, will then yes, it will be dislodged from on top of the stumps, but it won't. Uh, um, it will probably only fall onto the ground or depending how long the, the string is. But the law allows the allows for this. That's all that point number two is trying to tell us. Are you allowed to dispense with the bales? Are you allowed to take off the bales? Yes, the law allows for that. And when do you think you need to take off the bales? There is usually only one reason why would, why you would want to take off the bells. Uh, yes, especially here in in uh, in Cape Town, the wind. If the wind is howling and keep the bells keeps on blowing off, the law allows the umpires to take off or to dispense uh, with uh, the bells. And if you do decide to remove the bells or dispense with the bells due to a strong wind, you need to remove the bales from both ends. You find uh, in many a game, uh, only the one side is, is sometimes an issue. So only the, the, the one side will continuously blow off and for some reason the other end, the, the bales stays, uh, stays on. So the law tell us that if you do decide to take off the bells because of of um, gale force winds, and even if it only falls off on the one side, you need to take or remove the bells from both ends. You cannot only remove it from the one end where it continuously falls off and leave the other end as is, must take it off from both ends. And if the wind do uh, dies uh, uh, later on, you are then allowed to put the bales back on to the stumps. Tom, that is my section for this evening. I'm now passing the ball over to you. Thanks, Abdullah, and good evening to the candidates. I shall now share my screen and start presenting from law number nine. The law 
09 is the preparation and maintenance of the playing area. Abdullah has shown us what the pitch looks like and what the measurements are. Now we arrive at a match and what are some of the duties that we as umpires have to undertake? Let's see what the law says. Can the pitch be mowed? Yes, the pitch and the outfield can be mowed. And we're going to be talking mainly around more day matches. Remember that the laws of cricket cover a very general match of cricket and the closest format that we have and can relate to are test matches where we have more than one innings per side we've got two batting innings per side and we've also got multiple days in which the match takes place so when is mowing allowed both the pitch and the outfield shall be mown on each day of the match on which play is expected to take place if ground and weather conditions permit. This is done so that the playing field is as close as possible in conditions throughout the match from day one through to day five if we are playing a five day test match. If complete mowing of the outfield is not possible, the ground authority shall notify the captains and umpires of the procedure to be adopted for such mowing during the match. I've had a match before where there was a lot of rain overnight. In fact, it was the four day final between Free State and Northerns. And Abdullah was the on-field umpire back in 2017, along with a colleague of ours, Philip Foslu. I was the third umpire, and we had heavy overnight rain after the second day's play. And on the morning of the third day, even though the ground was fit for play, it was still a little bit... Um, wet on the surface of the grass and hence the ground staff did not want to mow the lawn because the lawn mower would probably get affected by mowing a wet lawn. Um, so what they did is they delayed it until very late and there are specific timings for mowing both of the pitch and the outfield which I will get to on subsequent slides, but it is always the ground staff who shall inform the umpires if mowing is possible or not. So what is the timing of the mowing? Mowing of the pitch on any day shall be completed not later than 30 minutes before the time scheduled or rescheduled for play to begin on that day and it needs to be done before any sweeping or rolling and rolling. So if you think about uh, preparation of the pitch, uh, the order is mowing of the pitch, then sweeping and then rolling. And in terms of timings, I've got a slide a little bit later on that we will look at in law 11, but Let's assume that our test match starts at 10 a.m. in the morning. So what the law tells us here is that mowing of the pitch shall be completed no later than 30 minutes before the scheduled time. And so if we are going to start at 10 a.m. and the weather is fine to do so, then mowing needs to be completed by 9.30. What typically happens in a four day match uh, domestically or a five day test match is that those three sequences that I mentioned, mowing, 
sweeping and rolling of the pitch. Uh, they happen one after each other while the third umpire is in attendance. And we will look at those exact times a little bit later once we've gone through all three processes. What about mowing of the outfield? Mowing of the outfield on any day shall be completed not later than 15 minutes before the scheduled or rescheduled start of play. So in my example, the ground staff at Pretoria University, where that four day final was being played, they asked for specific permission to mow the outfield as late as possible. So we actually went a little bit outside of the laws, but both captains agreed because they both wanted the outfield to be mowed. So instead of completing mowing of the outfield by 9.45 for a 10 a.m. start, we actually only completed mowing of the outfield as the on-field umpires were walking on to start play at 9.55. Typically, what happens is the mowing of the outfield is actually the first duty that the ground staff perform before umpires and players even get to the field, uh, simply because most teams practice on the outfield. So it would be impractical for mowing of the outfield to happen while the two teams before the match starts are practicing on the outfield. Uh, but on that particular day, we couldn't mow the outfield any earlier than five minutes to nine, or at least five minutes to 10, uh, is when we finished mowing the outfield on that day. So a bit of an exception to the law, uh, but both captains agreed. So that is why we were able to complete mowing of the outfield uh, later than the law prescribes. So now we have mowed our pitch at 9.25, and then we need to sweep the pitch. We need to clear the debris from the pitch. Debris shall be cleared before the start of each day's play, after the completion of mowing and before any rolling, not later than 30 minutes, nor later then, sorry, not earlier than 30 minutes, nor later than 10 minutes before the scheduled start of play. So, mowing of the pitch needs to be completed by 9.30. The law tells us here that sweeping of the pitch needs to take place between 9.30 and 9.50. Okay, so... As I mentioned, we do them in that sequence, mowing, sweeping, and then rolling. So typically the third umpire will come out to the field and inspect the mowing of the pitch. Also inspect the sweeping of the pitch as well as the rolling of the pitch. So they happen from 9.25, the mowing starts, has to be done by 9.30, and then 9.30 sweeping will take place, and then sweeping doesn't take long, probably a minute or two later, then the rolling can start, and we will get to the timing of the rolling very soon. Clearing of debris can also take place between innings, and again, it needs to be before rolling, if rolling is taking place. And whenever we have a lunch break, the ground staff is asked to sweep just to clear debris, especially off from the uh, creases that Abdullah has just described to us, where the batters stand, the less debris the better so that they don't slip on any loose um, 
parts of the pitch. The clearing of debris shall be done by sweeping, except where the umpires consider that this may be detrimental to the surface of the pitch. In this case, the debris must be cleared from that area by hand without sweeping. Quite often in the subcontinent in India, Asia, sorry, India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, um, those pitches are quite uh, dusty and you'll find that they're turning from ball one and come day three, four and five, they start to crumble. And this is what the law relates to in this particular point is that if sweeping using a broom uh, might crumble that pitch even further, then the ground staff must rather use their hands to sweep away the debris. Uh, not common practice in South Africa. Our pitches are usually uh, firm enough for us to always use a broom to sweep. Um, and I need to note that the sweeping generally happens only um, inside the creases and 1.52 meters in front of the popping crease. Anywhere after that is the start of what's called the protected area. And there we do not sweep. So we only sweep uh, 1.52 meters in front of the popping crease and backwards uh, behind the stumps all the way until the back tip of the return crease. So now we have mowed the pitch, we have swept the pitch, we are now ready to roll our pitch. How often and when do we roll the pitch? This is in your exam. During the match, the pitch may be rolled at the request of the captain of the batting side for a period of not more than seven minutes before the start of each innings other than the first innings of the match and before the start of each subsequent day's play. So yes, I just need to be clear about the fact that before play starts on day one, the ground staff can do absolutely anything they want to do to the pitch. They can roll it from 6 a.m. all the way up until the toss at 9.30. Uh, they are preparing the pitch as they feel it uh, necessary and they hand over the pitch to the umpires at the toss and we will find out later in the laws that the toss uh, happens earliest 30 minutes before the scheduled start of play or rescheduled start of play. Um, so these timings are not specific to um, day one of a test match and the frequency and the duration of how long you can roll. So before 9.30 on day one, the ground staff can do absolutely anything they wish to do with the pitch and they can roll for as much as they want. Uh, these timings and these durations are specific to once the match has started. So the law tells us that we cannot roll for more than seven minutes. And when can we roll? We can roll before the start of every subsequent day. So day two, day three, day four and day five of a test match. We can roll up to seven minutes and the timing of which needs to be no more than 30 minutes and no less than 10 minutes before the scheduled or rescheduled start of play. So that means going back to our timings, any time before 9.30 in the morning for a 10 a.m. start, we can mow the pitch. At 9.30, we can sweep the pitch 
and also from 9.30 to 9.50, we can start rolling. So you can start rolling as late as 9.50, and the maximum time for which you can roll is seven minutes. So that's before the day's play. And we always ask the captain whose team is batting at the time how long and which roller they would like to use to roll, if they would like to roll. So rolling is an option available to the batting captain. It is not mandatory for a batting captain to roll the pitch. So when we arrive at the ground on the second, third, fourth or fifth morning of a mm, test match, the uh, fourth umpire in a test match, because the third umpire is a TV umpire, the fourth umpire would go to the captain of the batting side and will ask which roller would he or she like to use and for how long would they like the pitch to be rolled if they want the pitch to be rolled. They are usually at provincial and international standard grounds, three rollers, a heavy roller, a medium sized roller and a light roller, which is typically handheld rather than motorized. Can a captain ask for the pitch to be rolled for five minutes? Yes, it's less than the maximum allowed of seven minutes. Can a captain ask for the pitch to be rolled for one minute? Yes, it is less than the maximum allowed of seven minutes. In previous courses, I've been asked if the batting captain can choose to roll the pitch with a heavy roller for four minutes and a light roller for three minutes. There's nothing in the law that uh, disallows that request. However, I can tell you that any groundsman around the country will tell that batting captain uh, to go fly a kite. Uh, they will probably not allow that request. They will tell the batting captain Either you want a heavy roller or a light roller or a medium roller, not a combination of either. Can the pitch be rolled sideways is another question that I've been asked. So instead of rolling lengthways from the um, one crease to the other, uh, can the, the groundsman roll the pitch uh, across the pitch instead of up and down the pitch. Again, it's nothing in the law that disallows that request. However, the groundsman, I'll tell you now, will say no to such a ridiculous request. Um, so those are the few things that we've been asked in the past about rolling. Um, what's important to remember is a maximum of seven minutes and it happens at the beginning of each subsequent day's play based on the batting captain's request and also when there is a change of innings. The team that is next coming into bat has the choice to roll or not to roll using either of the three rollers available for a maximum of seven minutes. Can a pitch be watered during a more day match? I'm sure you all will know or agree that the pitch shall not be watered during the match. Simple as that. Can and should creases be remarked? Definitely. Whenever either umpire consider it necessarily, necessary, and it happens usually during uh, intervals. So at Provincial level, we are lucky enough to get ground staff onto the field of play at a drinks break. If either of our creases are starting to fade and they will happily repaint the lines for us. 
at club level, uh, we're not so fortunate. Quite often what happens is you have one groundsman for four or five different grounds in the same area and he or she will set up and prepare field number one at six in the morning then move to field number two at seven in the morning move to field number three at eight in the morning and get to field number four at nine in the morning so you're very unlikely to find a groundsman in club cricket staying the whole day being able to remark creases for you um, but if the club has got access to the shed where the groundsman keeps all his or her equipment then uh, somebody can hopefully paint lines for you during the lunch interval for example the maintenance of footholds this is especially um, key during uh, test matches later days in test matches where fast bowlers landing on the popping crease have created almost a crater which can be dangerous to land on if you land awkwardly you could twist your ankle um, so the law allows for the repair and replacement of footholds overnight in more day matches if necessary, the returfing of footholds made by the bowlers in their delivery stride or the use of quick setting fillings for that purpose can happen as long as they are dry and hard enough the next morning for play to continue safely. During play, umpires shall allow the players to secure their footholds by the use of sawdust, provided that no damage to the pitch is caused and that fair and unfair play is not an issue. That is maintenance of the pitch. Now we move on to covering the pitch. Before the match, Shall the pitch be covered? Let's see what the law tells us. The use of covers before the match is the responsibility of the ground authority and may include full covering if required. Remember I mentioned that up until 9.30 on the morning of a 10 a.m. start, the ground belongs to the ground staff or the ground authority as law um, describes that person or people as they hand over the field to the umpires at the toss so any time before that it is the responsibility of the ground authority and they may cover the pitch as they see fit the ground authority shall grant suitable facility to the captains to inspect the pitch before the nomination of their players and the toss taking place because the toss takes place between 9 30 and 9 45 the teams would obviously like to see what the pitch looks like before they decide if they're going to bat or bowl first in club cricket in western province cricket association we have a playing condition that says an hour before the match is scheduled to start if weather allows then the covers shall be removed by the home side if they are not removed by 9 a.m for a 10 a.m start uh, then the club can face a huge penalty or docking of points um, that is as strict as it gets and that is why in our playing conditions it's also required for umpires to be at the field an hour before 
the match is scheduled to start. Abdullah on Monday told us that the law says umpires are required to be at the field 45 minutes before the scheduled start of play. However, remember I told you on Monday that playing conditions override the law. So for us, if you join Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, any matches that we officiate on that are based on Western Province Cricket Association playing conditions, you need to be at the ground an hour before the start of play. And one of the things that you're going to check is have the home team removed the covers from the pitch. During the match, what do we do with the covers? Unless provided otherwise by regulations or by agreement before the toss on each night of the match and in inclement weather, at any time during the match, the whole pitch and a minimum of 1.22 meters beyond it shall be covered. So Abdullah has just given us the measurements of the um, creases. You'll remember that the return creases are a minimum of 2.44 meters. Between the popping crease and the bowling crease, that part of the return crease is 1.22 meters and the other half which is behind the bowling crease is also a minimum of 1.22 meters uh, so essentially if the return crease is the minimum of 2.44 meters as prescribed by law then uh, the return crease needs to be covered by the covers as per this particular law. Where possible, the bowler's run-ups shall also be covered. This is because, as Abdullah mentioned on Monday, to prevent dangerous or unreasonable conditions, the bowlers need to have good foothold as they land, but also a good run up towards their delivery stride. When do we remove the covers? The covers shall be removed as soon as practical on each day that play is expected to take place. So even though our playing conditions dictate that they have to be removed an hour before the day's play, uh, they can be removed a lot earlier than that and usually on sunny days when there is no sign of any rain around when we arrive at a field an hour before the scheduled start of play uh, the covers are already taken off so that is the norm earlier rather than later if covers are used during the day as protection from inclement weather, or if inclement weather delays the removal of overnight covers, they shall be removed promptly as conditions allow. Okay, so no need to keep the covers on while it's not raining. Why? Because if there was overnight rain and the pitch was covered, then you can almost always expect that there will be sweat under the covers and the pitch will be uh, a little bit moist on the top layer. Um, so that is why you need to remove those covers as early as possible to give the pitch time to breathe and dry up completely before the start of play. So here we see in England, they use uh, hover covers. And we've got a video of one of them actually being used to cover the pitch. And I think I haven't added my sound, so I'm just going to un share and then reshare before 
playing the video. Play with me, please. Include computer sound. There we go. This is the scene at Trent Bridge, Nottingham. Second day, the game between Nottinghamshire and Durham. The last beat started to rain. Consulate scene as uh, this light drizzle has been falling since the start of play has got a little heavier. We all hope that it won't last for very long. So, this is the uh, that's the county hall with a green roof, the headquarters of the Nottinghamshire County Council. And over there is the world renowned, as it said on it, Trent Bridge Inn. So, it's Michael Parkinson saying cheerio for now. What you don't see in this video is that the hovercraft can actually lift so that there's space between the bottom of the hover and the pitch. And that way, while the pitch is being covered and protected from getting wet by the rain, it's still able to breathe and uh, not get, not sweat and get um, too damp because the dampness causes uh, excessive grass growth as well. Um, and if a pitch is covered for um, a rain delay of say three, four, five hours, when you uncover the pitch, you cannot mow the pitch that same day because you would have mowed it in the morning before the start of play the grass would have grown. You will be surprised how much grass can grow uh, in a day. And those of you who watch a lot of test match cricket will know that the more grass there is on a pitch, uh, the more seam movement that the pitch will create. So uh, definitely changes in conditions that you don't want on a pitch. And that's why the hover cover is probably where the world is moving in terms of covering of pitches. We do also have an example of covering in Sri Lanka. And here you'll see that the entire field is covered. Uh, this is a stadium in Gaul and the area in Sri Lanka is um, quite common in terms of 
floods and monsoons and a lot of rain that often hits this particular field and that's why the ground authority decided that whenever there is heavy rain then they shall cover the entire uh, ground including the outfield not just the pitch obviously it takes a long time to put all of those covers on and probably even longer to take them off uh, but that is to make sure that the outfield doesn't get drenched and play can resume sooner rather than later once the covers are off. That is maintenance of the playing area as well as covering of the pitch. Our last law for this evening is law 11, which is intervals. What are the intervals that we have in cricket? Please make note of these because they are tested in the Level 1 Cricket South Africa exam. The period between the close of play on day one and the start of play on day two, that is an interval, as well as obviously all the other close of plays until the start of play the subsequent day. Intervals between innings, when side A has finished batting, there will be an interval until side B starts batting. And we will get into the lengths of these intervals in the next few slides. There's also an interval for meals, and the law does not specify how long your lunch break or supper break needs to be that is specified in the playing conditions of the particular tournament that you'll be umpiring in intervals for drinks they are governed in terms of the length as to how long a interval for drinks may be and we will get to that at a later stage um, but the T interval, for example, is not governed in terms of how long that needs to be. Then we have any other agreed interval. I can only think of one example over the years. Probably about 20 years ago now, England was playing Australia in an Ashes Test match at Lords, and the Queen wanted to visit or at least meet the players uh, on the field during the match. And with her schedule being tight, she was only available at quarter past two on that particular Thursday afternoon. And the test match times, which we will look at in the subsequent slide, you will note that quarter past two is not a scheduled time for an interval in a test match. So for that particular test match on that particular day one, they had to agree to an extra interval of 15 minutes while the Queen went onto the field of play. Play stopped and she met and greeted all 22 players from both sides. So that was an example of any other agreed interval in a test match. So here are our test match times, and these again are not in law, but I will be using these as a basis to explain a lot of scenarios that the law talks about in the next few slides. So as mentioned, Lunch and tea interval durations are stipulated by playing conditions, not by law. The morning session, and these do change from country to country. This is a typical test match times for matches in South Africa. We have three sessions, morning session. All of them are two hours. The morning sessions from 10 a.m. until midday. 
Then we have lunch from 12 until 12.40. Then we've got the afternoon session from 12.40 until 14.40. Then we've got our 20 minute tea interval. And as mentioned, the length of the lunch and the tea interval are specified in test match playing conditions, not in law. And then we've got an evening session from 1500 to 1700. Um, close of play can be later than 1700 um, as prescribed by the playing conditions, but we will stick to these times uh, for the purposes of any examples that I shall be giving you. So let's look at the duration of the intervals. An interval for lunch or tea shall be of the duration agreed. So as per the playing conditions in test match cricket, a lunch break is 40 minutes and a tea break is 20 minutes. And this duration is taken from the call of time before the interval until the call of play on resumption after the interval. The one duration that is stipulated in terms of how long an interval shall be is the interval between innings. So if South Africa is a bowled out by Australia and they are bowled out not at the time of an interval of lunch or tea, then we shall take a 10 minute interval between innings, commencing from the close of South Africa's innings until the call of play for the start of Australia's innings. But what happens if an innings ends when 10 minutes or less remains before the time agreed for close of play on any day? So going back to my test match times, the evening session is from 3 p.m. until 5 p.m. So the law tells us here that if South Africa's innings ends at 16.55, which is five minutes before the scheduled close of play, there shall be no further play on that day. No change shall be made to the time for the start of play on the following day. Okay, so if the innings ends at 16.51, 1652 all the way up to 1659 in fact even if it ends at 1650 that is when 10 minutes or less remain before the time agreed for the close of play then the match shall be halted for that day's play What happens if a captain declares an innings closed and we will get to declaration and forfeits next week's lectures? What happens if a captain declares an innings closed more than 10 minutes duration provided that at least 10 minutes remains of the interruption or the interval? Um, sorry, let me just uh, describe this in simpler language. If the innings is declared during an interval, so we know that our lunch break is 40 minutes from 12 until 12.40. If South Africa's captain declares the innings closed, at 12.15, that is during the lunch interval. We will take our close of innings or change of innings during the lunch interval from 12.15 to 12.25. And we will restart play at the end of the lunch interval at 12.40. We are not going to extend the lunch interval by an extra 10 minutes because the entire 10 minutes of the change of innings happens completely within the lunch break of 
40 minutes from 12 to 12.40. Okay, so no adjustment shall be made to the time for resumption of play on account of the 10 minute interval between innings, which shall be considered as included in the interruption or interval. However, if less than 10 minutes remains of the interruption or interval when the captain declares the innings closed, the next innings shall commence 10 minutes after the declaration is made. So going back to our test match times, if a captain declares the innings closed at 12.35, remember that lunch is supposed to end at 12.40, but if the captain declares at 12.35, then we need to have an entire 10 minutes for the change of innings interval. Why? Because remember that the captain who is going to bat next has the option to roll the pitch for up to seven minutes. And it does take a while to get the roller on the field and take the roller back off the field after rolling for seven minutes. So you do need to always have a 10 minute interval. If it fits into the lunch interval completely, that's perfect, that's easy. No need to extend the lunch interval. But in this example, we've had a declaration made at 1235, so we cannot go back on and resume play at 1240. Why? Because we've only had five minutes of our change of innings interval. So we will resume play at 12.45 with Team B batting, not at 12.40, but at 12.45 after the 10 minute interval is now complete. I hope that makes sense. Then, the law allows for changing of the lunch interval and changing of the tea interval so that if there's any rain around, we can maximize play by trying to include the rain into a lunch or tea break. So let's see what the law allows us in terms of changing the agreed times for these intervals when there is ground weather and light interruptions. Law says that if at any time during the match, either playing time is lost through adverse conditions of ground weather or light or in exceptional circumstances, and I'll give you an example of an exceptional circumstance I've had in a match between Western Province and KwaZulu-Natal, a sight screen collapsed under heavy wind and it was made out of hundreds of pipes and all of those pipes fell onto the field and obviously they had to be removed and the sight screen rebuilt before play could resume. So that was an exceptional circumstance um, and law allowed us to move the lunch break. Um, how did law allow us to move the lunch break? Let us see. The law says that if uh, there are exceptional circumstances or the players have occasion to leave the field other than at a scheduled interval, the time of the lunch interval or of the T interval may be changed if the two umpires and both captains agree to changing of the lunch or the T interval. Okay, so this is not a decision that's made solely by the umpires. Both captains also have to agree for the changing of the lunch break or the T break. However, we're going to look at examples where no agreement is required and the law specifies that change 
can and should be made to the lunch interval or the tea interval times. So when can we change the agreed time for lunch? If an innings ends when 10 minutes or less remain before the agreed time for lunch, the interval shall be taken immediately. It shall be of the agreed duration and shall be considered to include the 10 minute interval between innings. So day two of a test match, South Africa has batted well on day one. They are 402 for seven wickets at the beginning of day two. And they bat on and they bat on. And at 11.52, they are bowled out for 520 runs. Remember that our test match times stipulate that the morning session is from 10 a.m. until 12 midday. So 11.52 is within the agreed, within 10 minutes of the agreed scheduled time for lunch. So what does law say? Law says that if an innings ends when 10 minutes or less remain before the agreed time for lunch, then the interval shall be taken immediately. So at 11.52, when South Africa is all out, then we take lunch immediately and the 10 minute changeover is included or shall considered to be included in the 40 minute lunch break. So we will resume play 40 minutes later at 12.32, okay? We're not adding an extra 10 minutes to our lunch break because why? The change of innings is included in that lunch break of 40 minutes. So this is what the law is telling us in this particular point. When else can we change the agreed time for lunch? If because of adverse conditions of ground, weather or light, or in exceptional circumstances, a stoppage occurs when 10 minutes or less remains before the agreed time for lunch. Then whether there is an agreement or not between captains, the interval shall be taken immediately. It shall be of the agreed duration and play shall resume at the end of this interval or as soon as conditions permit. OK, so let's give an example again. 10 a.m. start. We're supposed to have lunch at 12, but it starts raining at 11.54. What does law tell us? Law tells us that we do not need an agreement between the umpires or the captains because there is an interruption within 10 minutes of the agreed scheduled time for lunch. We take lunch immediately and it will be for the agreed duration of 40 minutes and we shall go back onto the field weather conditions permitting at 12.34. I think we said we came off at 11.54, so 11.54 plus 40 minutes is 12.34 resumption ground weather and light conditions permitting. So that is changing agreed time for lunch. What about the T interval? Remember our T interval, according to test match times, is supposed to be from 1440 to 1500. Can we change, when else can we change the T interval? Let's see what the law says. If an innings ends when 30 minutes or less remains before the agreed time for T, the interval shall be taken immediately. This is in green, so it will be tested in the level one Cricket South Africa umpiring exam. The interval shall be of the agreed duration and shall be considered to include the 10 minute interval between innings. So let's make another example. Australia is batting on day three and their innings ends at 14.15. 1415. So remember that the T 
break is supposed to be at 1440 and 1415 is 25 minutes before the scheduled tea break of 1440. So that means it does fall within your 30 minute window period. So that means for this particular day, we will take tea at 14, 15, quarter past two. Why? Because an innings has ended within 30 minutes of the scheduled tea break. We will still only take tea for 20 minutes, so we will resume play at 15.35. And so our evening session will be longer. We will go from, uh, sorry, 14.35. We will go all the way till 1700.00. What about if when 30 minutes remains before the agreed time for T, an interval between innings is already in progress? What shall we do then? Law tells us that play shall resume at the end of the 10 minute interval if conditions permit, and we will play until 1440 when we will take T. So let me give you that example in times. Australia's innings ended at 14.05. And the 10 minute change of interval was taken. So they resume at 14.15. So when 30 minutes remained before the agreed time, which was 14.10, we were in the middle of that interval. Law tells us that we carry on with that interval. And after the interval, we go back on the field at 14.15, and we play until 14.40, which is our normal scheduled time for T, and we take T until 1500, and the last session is unaffected from 1500 to 1700. If because of adverse conditions of ground, weather or light, or in exceptional circumstances, a stoppage occurs when 30 minutes or less remains before the agreed time for T, then unless there's an agreement to change the time for T, or the captains agree to forego the T interval, the interval shall be taken immediately. So this is a pretty simple one. If it starts raining at 14.20, we are within 30 minutes of the T break. The normal schedule T break is 14.40. So law tells us that because we're within 30 minutes of the scheduled tea break when it starts to rain at 14.20, we take tea immediately. The interval shall be of the agreed duration and play shall resume at the end of the interval or as soon as conditions permit, whichever comes later. So once we start tea, we need to take tea for 20 minutes. So 14.20, even if it stops raining at 14.30, we got to munch those scones and drink that tea until 14.40, and only then can we go back onto the park weather, ground, and light conditions permitting. We've got a couple of more examples. If a stoppage is already in progress, when 30 minutes remains before the agreed time for T, bring T forward by 30 minutes. So what does this mean? This means that it started raining at 2 p.m., 1400. Now, are we within the 30 minutes of the T break? No, not yet. The T break is scheduled for 1440, so we are 40 minutes away from the T break when the rain starts at 1400. Law tells us that if it's still raining at 1410 and we're still off the field, 
then we can take T at 1410 and it shall be for the agreed length of 20 minutes. So if the rain has stopped by 1430 after the 20 minute tea break, then we can go back onto the field at 1430. And again, we will have an extended evening session. OK, weather, ground and light conditions permitting. The next law applies to both the tea interval and the lunch interval when nine wickets are down. Long winded paragraph. In fact, it's one sentence. But it's really straightforward. So our lunch break is supposed to be at 12. Law tells us that if nine wickets are down at 12 o'clock or when the over ends at one minute past 12 or two minutes past 12, whenever that last over for lunch ends, if we are still nine wickets down, then we do not take lunch because typically your number 11 batter doesn't last very long. So we don't want to take lunch for 40 minutes and then come back and the number 11 batter is out two minutes later. So law says that we will carry on playing up until the 10th wicket is taken or 30 minutes later than the original scheduled lunch break. So if at 12.30 they are still only nine wickets down, the bowling side hasn't managed to take the 10th wicket and end the innings, only at 12.30 will we take lunch. Okay. Unless the players have cause to leave the field of play or the innings is completed earlier. And the same law, remember, applies to the tea break. If at 1440, the batting side is nine wickets down, we play on until the 10th wicket is taken, or we play on for another 30 minutes, uh, which would be 1510, and only then, when that over ends, do we take tea. Intervals for drinks. As mentioned, there is a time limit for drinks. Each interval shall be kept as short as possible and shall not exceed five minutes. Um, five minutes is the duration for drinks in one day internationals. In test matches, the duration is four minutes and in T20 cricket, international cricket, it's recently been introduced. Yes, you guessed it. Two and a half minutes for a drinks break after the 10th over in T20 internationals. This is as per International Cricket Council playing conditions. You can see it's not in the law. All the law tells us that the maximum length of a drinks break shall be five minutes. Unless the captains agree to forego a drinks break, it shall be taken at the end of the over in progress when the agreed time is reached. So in our test match times, the morning session, as I mentioned, is from 10 a.m. until 12. The drinks break is always taken halfway through a session. So in a test match, it would be 11 a.m. and for four minutes, if, however, a wicket falls or a batter retires within five minutes of the agreed time, then drinks shall be taken immediately. So if a wicket falls at 10.57, that is within five minutes of the agreed 
time for the morning drink at 11 a.m. Then we take drinks at 10.57 and it shall remain the agreed duration of four minutes in a test match. If you have an elongated session, uh, like I mentioned, because you can move tea and lunch around. So say, for example, we now have a evening session that's going to be uh, two and a half hours. Um, it's not in the laws. It's not in playing conditions. It's just a general agreement that umpires around the world have decided if a session is zero to 99 minutes, there shall be no drinks breaks. If a session is between 100 minutes and 149 minutes, which is two hours and 29 minutes, then there shall be uh, one drinks break halfway between the session. And if a session is 150 minutes or longer, then there shall be two drinks breaks in that session and you split the session up into um, three. Um, so in a 150 minute session, which is two and a half hours long, you would say 150 divided by three, which is 50 minutes. You would take a drinks break after 50 minutes and then uh, have your four minute drinks break and then play again for 50 minutes and have another four minutes drinks break and then uh, you'll have your end of your day after that long two and a half hour session. Intervals for drinks may not be taken during the last hour of the match. We will get to the last hour of the match next week in Lord. 12, if I'm not mistaken. And what's important to remember is that we as umpires are in the same team as the scorers. So we shall always ensure that the scorers are informed of all agreements about hours of play and intervals and any changes made there too, as permitted under these laws and the playing conditions of the tournament you are officiating in. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is my presentation for this evening. Uh, apologies that it's gone over time I'm again. I seem to be uh, the slower of the two batters between myself and Abdullah, um, but I believe Law 11 is one of the more important ones for us to go through thoroughly. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to our chat box and I'm going to go through the questions that have been asked while we've been presenting. I am going to switch my camera on and I'm going to switch my lights on as well. I'm sitting in the darkness here and I'm going to um, go through these questions with Abdullah and he's also going to switch his camera on once yeah. we are, are done with the um questions in the chat box then we shall activate everybody else's camera and everybody else's microphone uh, to engage with us um, no carl uh, luckily i'm not being load shed it's just that i started in brightness and uh, i forgot to switch my lights on uh, which I will do after I give the first question to Abdullah. Um, Abdullah, first question is from Mark. Just to clarify, at provincial level and upwards, the umpires should do a kit inspection of both teams to check the bats and keepers gloves are within regulations before the game starts. Uh, please describe that process to us. Yes, Mark, um, if I can start at uh, international level. So what happens, the, um, the umpires are there, or, or uh, the, um, the umpires are usually there two, three days before the game starts, and players use our teams, they usually have net sessions. So what the umpires uh, do is they attend the net sessions of both 
the uh, the teams and during those net sessions the fourth umpire or actually all umpires will then do uh, kit inspections so while the players are uh, padding up batting up the fourth umpire will be roaming around uh, players usually come to the uh, um, to the umpire asking you happy with this is this okay the umpires will then do random checks um, I can remember I did a random check at the SA20 um, and Owen Morgan um, was one of the players um, Kita checked and he had quite a huge bag. There was literally about 12 different bats uh, in his bag of different uh, sizes. I had a bat gauge with me and I, and I took them um, through the bat gauges and all 12 uh, passed uh, pass the test. So to answer your question, yes, at international level, it happens um, at those net sessions prior to the um, to the start um, of the game, and both teams um, get uh, get sick because umpires attend net sessions of uh, both the teams. Uh, at uh, provincial level as well, we we do checks again before the game starts. Uh, even once the game has started, if there is something that we do pick up that we're not happy with, we then will um, address it. If a bat needs to be checked, we, we will check it. If uh, with the other equipment that doesn't comply with the clothing regulations, we will also um, um, check those and uh, advise the players um, accordingly. So yeah, that is at um, provincial and at international level. Um, over Tom. I'm not sure, Tom, if you want to just maybe discuss at club level, how we handle club level. Um, thanks, Tula. Before I explain club level, I'm just going to mention that at the 100, uh, which is a new competition in England, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it on television, the umpires actually carry their bat gauges on the field and check each incoming batter's bat size um, before they bat. And at our preseason conference, Cricket South Africa umpires, we decided that we wouldn't do that because it would waste a lot of time if a batter's bat was found to be too big um, on the field. So that's why we do all our checks before a tournament and before matches. Um, and it's not really an issue in four day cricket. We find that batters uh, are going to use the big long hitting bats in the shorter formats of the game. And that's probably why the um, the high and hundred umpires decided that they would check it uh, on the field. Um, as Abdullah mentioned, a lot of batters have a lot of bats and the problem with us checking their bats at net sessions is that we won't probably check all of their bats uh, but i think you can probably see when a batter comes onto the field with an extremely large bat that hang on maybe we need to check this guy um, but we we haven't had any issues on our side uh, coming to club cricket um only us provincial umpires have been issued bat gauges with by Cricket South Africa. So unfortunately, it's almost impossible for us as club umpires, and there's 107 active members of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, and only four bat gauges to go around. So we cannot uh, regulate bat sizes in club cricket. Um, the process is if a club umpire suspects a bat is too large that they would call one of us Cricket South Africa umpires and we would try and track that particular batter down before their next match. Uh, but for the pros, uh, for, for that particular match that, that club umpire is involved in, um, they will merely make a note of a bat that seems too large, but will not uh, stop the batter from using that particular bat. Next question is from Raghavan. Uh, he had network issues in Thailand and joined a little bit late. 
He wants to know if law five is being covered in the lecture today. And uh, Raghavan, the answer is yes. Abdullah did go through law five. He started with law five. And you can watch the recording on YouTube. Uh, hopefully today we are not uh, banned by um, YouTube or our video is not restricted. We don't have any uh, IPL uh, clips that we've shown, so I'm sure the uh, the video will be posted successfully on YouTube tonight, two hours after the end of the lecture. Next question is from Tamil. Abdullah, what is the measurements of a bail? Um, I don't think you mentioned them. I have no idea what the measurements of a bail are. I've never measured a bail in my life. Uh, but I know you do because you are a walking, talking law book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tom, I will put up my hand and tell you, I don't know the exact measurements of the bell. If I do, I actually, re if, if I get asked this question, I do refer the uh, uh, anyone to the book. Uh, and, uh, under um, law um, 8, they do give um, detailed measurements of the bell. Um, they do tell you how long the bell should be. I think the length of the bell is 10.95 centimeters. They tell you how long the short spigot is, the, the, the long spigot is, how long the barrel uh, should be. I don't know them off by heart, but they definitely um, in the law book under uh, law eight. Yeah, Tamil mentions it's on page 56. So Tamil, you've obviously got the law book open there. Uh, or you've got the PDF that I sent with course material. Um, guys and ladies, anything that we do not present is not tested in the level one exam. And um, so you don't need to worry about memorizing the size of bales. What you do need to memorize or at least uh, know the, the type of lengths is of the pitch and the creases, as Abdullah mentioned. I think they are up to 10 marks. You don't have to memorize them. You just, because remember, the questions are all true or false or multiple choice. So you will see the numbers given to you. You just need to recognize which is the correct length of the pop increase, for example. OK. Next question is from Abhishek. Uh, he asks if there is a participation certificate that uh, we will be providing after the session. Uh, Abhishek, uh, no, there is no uh, participation certificates issued. The certificate that you get is after passing the Cricket South Africa Level 1 online exam. Uh, there are 69 questions, you need 80% for a pass, which is 56 correct answers. And the exam is a 90 minutes long and you have up to 90 minutes to um, attempt uh, the online exam. And if you take longer than 90 minutes, the computer will stop you after 90 minutes and only um, mark those questions that you have answered. If you don't get 56 out of 69 or more, you will have another four attempts to try and get 80%. And once your certificate is, sorry, once you pass an exam, you will not get the chance to improve your mark. Uh, you will get your results displayed on the screen once you've submitted your answers. And if you've passed, the certificate will be issued to training at wpcua.co.za, which is my email address, one of my email addresses, and I will forward that certificate to you as soon as I can. Uh, I promise within 12 hours of you passing that you will have your certificate. OK, so there's no participation certificate given, um, only a certificate once you pass your level one exam. 
next question is from uh, Nil Nilesh. He says I must speak a little bit faster. OK, that's interesting. I've never been asked to speak faster. I think we try and keep it uh, slow and we repeat each uh, ourselves often to try and make sure that the understanding is entrenched in all of you. Right. Um, next question is from Yash. Law 11.6.4. In the presentation slide, it was mentioned that if stoppage is already in progress when 30 minutes remains before the agreed time for T, bring T forward by 30 minutes. Whereas the law book says that in such a scenario, uh, law 11.4 shall apply. And law 11.4 says that timings of lunch and tea can be changed if both the umpires and captains agree. Um, so Abdullah, I'm just going to give my understanding and then you can just confirm if I'm right or wrong. Um, so quite right, 11.4 uh, says that captains can agree to change the uh, time for lunch and tea uh, if there are uh, any ground weather and light interruptions or exceptional circumstances. Uh, law 11.6.4, however, says that there does not have to be an agreement if a stoppage is already in progress when 30 minutes remains before the agreed time for T, then take T at 30 minutes before the scheduled start of the tea break. So I made the example that if it starts raining at 1400, we are still 40 minutes before the scheduled uh, break of tea. Um, so if it's still raining at 1410, then we take T at 1410 and it shall be the agreed period of 20 minutes and we shall resume play at 1430. Uh, Abdullah, have I got my laws right and my timings correct on that example? Uh, yes, Tom, uh, spot on. 11.4 uh, can be activated. Let's say at two o'clock it starts raining hmm. and if both umpires and both captains agree, then 11.4 can be activated by taking uh, tea time at, at 2 o'clock. But if 11.4 does not get activated, tea will automatically be taken at 14.10 because it falls, um, there's a stoppage in place 30 minutes before the agreed time for tea. Uh, over, Tom. Perfect. Thanks for confirming that, Jula. Next question is from Mr. Pinar. In limited overs cricket, is it under playing conditions to decide when to take the drinks and lunch breaks, or do you discuss that with the teams before the match, Abdullah? Uh, Mr. Pinar, um, in limited limited over matches and uh, also in uh, in test matches, the governing body um, of cricket for that particular uh, match, and let's use um, a limited over game. Um, let's say it's a 50 over game, um, uh, 50 over uh, international. The governing body, which is the International Cricket Council, so the ICC, they draw up playing conditions for that particular competition. They um, they give the, the timings, uh, usually three and a half hours to bowl your, your 50 overs in. They also tell you uh, in the playing conditions, in that three and a half hours uh, that you get to complete your 50 overs, you get two drinks breaks, and they will shall be one hour, ten minutes apart. So if they are, if um, if your uh, play starts at ten o'clock, your first drinks break will be at eleven ten, and your second drinks break shall be at twelve twelve twenty. So to answer your question, playing conditions gets uh, um, the um, the 
governing body, they draw up the playing conditions and they put the times in and they do specify exactly when your drinks break should be. Also in test matches, um, there are uh, three two-hour sessions and the playing conditions states that there shall be a drinks break in the middle of your session. So uh, if the game starts at 10 o'clock, lunch will be at at 12 o'clock and in the middle which is 11 o'clock you'll have a four minute uh, drinks break over to you tom thanks Tula. um next we have a few questions from vinayak i'm going to read two of them and answer two of them and then i'm going to give the the last one, which is actually the first one to you, Dula. Um, so Vinayak's second point is dimensions of the bells were omitted. We've already dealt with that. Um, not something that we need to cover in level one. Uh, they are there in the law book for you to uh, memorize if you wish to, but you do not need to know them for level one. Uh, and in fact, practically, uh, you can see if the bells are the correct size when you put them on top of stumps. Um, if they are not fitting on top of stumps, then uh, either the stumps are not pitched correctly or uh, the bells are incorrect size. Um, his fourth point, if a captain requests for two rollers within seven minutes, is there provision for that in the laws? Um, I think Vinayak might have uh, joined us late because I did mention that there's nothing in the law that disallows uh, more than one roller to be used in that seven minute period. Uh, but the groundsman will probably tell the captain that he's not prepared to use more than one roller in one rolling stint. So um, when we ask the captains which roller they want, we usually only allow for one roller to be used. And then Abdullah, what is the significant significance of the three creases? Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if uh, if you've got an answer for that, but uh, that's Vinayak's last question. And uh, he does have his hand raised. Um, so maybe you can give your significance of the um, creases and then we can allow him, I'm going to unmute all participants now. Um, you can allow him to, to sort of ask a further question or maybe want clarity on one of the answers I've given. Uh, thanks for your question, uh, Vinayak. So the, the three creases, uh, there are 42 laws and the three creases gets used in many of, of the 42 uh, laws. The uh, uh, we covered uh, this evening the length of the pitch needs to be 20.12 meters. So where do you measure it uh, uh, from and where does it end? That's where the bowling crease comes into uh, into measured from the back edge of the bowling crease on the one side to the back edge of the bowling crease on the other side. The um, the return creases well, are they important? When we when we're gonna do um, um, cover the the noble law, you will see that uh, the the return creases is crucial in judging the back foot uh, noble uh, popping crease. Why is that important? Uh, judging the uh, the front foot uh, noble, so you need to have part of your uh, foot with a grounded or raised behind the popping crease uh, upon first landing. Uh, the uh, popping crease is important uh, because uh, scoring runs, so if you if you do run more than one uh, um, run, uh, whether it's two or three, you, um, you do need to put your, your bat behind the popping crease in, in turning for a second run. Popping crease is important um, for um, stumping or even runouts. You need to be behind the, uh, the crease while the ball is still alive. For stumping, you need to be behind the crease when the bells are dislodged. Um, for runouts, you need to be behind the, um, you have a part of your bat or person behind the popping crease when the bells are dislodged. Those are just some of the instances where those three creases uh, um, are important. So for, for many a law, the creases are 
very important. I'm not sure if you want to add anything there, Tom, but um, those are the, for me, the significant ones where the creases are very important. Um, I'm quite happy for us to deal with the creases in forthcoming laws, Abdullah. Um, so thank you for that comprehensive answer. Uh, Vinayak, I see your hand is up. Um, do you want to ask a uh, further <coughs> clarity? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thanks for the clarifications. But in what I mentioned in question number four is there is provision in the laws if the captain asks for two bonus within seven minutes. And you said there is no provision in the laws, but groundsman will not allow. No, there is provision in the law and umpires will not allow that. Okay, that's 913. That's news to me. Um, I will go read up on that law. Ab Ab Abdullah? If, if more than one roller is available, captain can ask for any one roller. Yes, so uh, Vinayak, that's quite correct. As I mentioned, there are usually up to three rollers available at a provincial ground in South Africa and international grounds around the world. Um, what I said is that the batter, batting captain can choose any one of those three um, rollers, but you cannot you cannot ask the groundsman to uh, roll. Yes, you can ask the groundsman to roll for four minutes with the heavy roller and three minutes with the light roller. It is allowable by law, but practically I've never had any captain request that. And I'm quite sure that if such a request is made, the groundsman will, will deny it. What I, what I am telling you, the captain cannot request for more than one roller because 19.1.3 is very clear which one to be used, the wordings used. So captain has the choice of using only one roller. Okay. For not more than seven minutes. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that input, Pinayak. Next question is from Gokul. In a one day international, if the first innings is completed in the 25th over, what is the exact time of the original 40 minute break between innings? So Abdullah, will we still have the lunch break at 13.30 uh, or will we take the lunch break at 11.30 when the innings has ended early? Tom, the uh, Coco, thanks for your question. The ODI playing condition states uh, that as soon as the first innings ends, the lunch interval shall be taken. So let's say um, game starts at 10, 25 overs probably take you about 100 minutes. So let's say it'll probably be at uh, 11.50, the innings will end. I mean, taking into account, there'll probably be a few wickets and a drinks break. So let's say at 12 o'clock, the, the innings of the team batting first would have ended. According to the playing conditions, the interval needs to be taken immediately. So the interval will start at 12 o'clock uh, and it will be uh, of, let's say it's 40 minute duration. The interval actually in, at, um, in, in 50 over internationals is half an hour. So the team batting second will start the innings at 12.30 in ODIs. Over, Tom. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dula. Um, Abhishek asks, what is the process? Uh, Abhishek, I'm not sure what you are referring to. Are you still available to ask us your question live? If you are, please unmute your microphone and the floor is yours. If not, we will move to the next question from Fazaj. One of the bowlers is going to bowl in the bowling crease with his or her front foot landing on the bowling crease, Abdullah. Is that a no ball or is that a fair delivery? Uh, 
when when judging the 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 front foot noble the crease that you need to take into account is the popping crease and the uh, question that you need to ask yourself is is there any part of the front foot whether grounded or raised behind the popping crease upon first lang landing if the answer to your question yes the east part of the front foot behind the popping crease upon first lang landing then it's a fair delivery if the answer to your question is no there's no part of the front foot um, uh, upon first landing behind the popping crease then that should be a no ball so to answer your question uh, if if the front foot is on the bowling on the bowling crease so remember the front foot uh, is associated with the popping crease so if it is the bowling crease if you ask you, yourself the question is the part of that front foot behind the popping crease the answer is yes because the bowling crease is 1.22 meters behind the the um, the popping crease so yes the east part of the front foot behind the popping crease so that would be a fair delivery over Tom. Thanks, Tula. Uh, next question is from Yash. He says he's expanding on a previous question. As per my understanding, and also mentioned in Tom Smith, if stoppage is already in progress at the 30 minute deadline, then an agreement between captains and umpires is permitted. Otherwise, T will be taken at the agreed time. Um, Abdullah, I think we will both disagree on that because the law is pretty clear that um, if a stoppage is in progress, when we get to 30 minutes before the scheduled time for T, then T will be taken. Uh, Yash, uh, Tom Smith is is very technical, and um, I know that the language used in Tom Smith is sometimes very difficult to understand. Um, but yeah, we stick to the law book, and the law we feel is pretty clear on this one that the T will be taken at fourteen ten. If we were off the field at 1400 because it started raining and we are still off the field at 1410 we do not need an agreement between captains t will be taken at 1410 and shall be the agreed duration of 20 minutes and we will go back onto the field at 1430 ground weather and light conditions permitting next question is from nilesh do umpires get any training from the ICC and Hawkeye about technology, Abdullah? Yes, Nilesh. The elite umpires and actually all the umpires on the on the international panel, they do get uh, regular training from the ICC. And uh, if there's any changes to to the DRS process, and if they need, and Orca also give uh, um, have sessions where they give uh, clarity and a better understanding on how the the tools the tools work and the processes um, um, work. So to answer your question, yes, they do get uh, regular training. They also do uh, regular simulation sessions. Um, with their respective um, umpire uh, coaches, some of them at least um, once a week to go through the uh, the the processes, to go through the uh, the various um, uh, technology, um, whether it's um, whether it's Hawkeye, whether it's um, Ultra Ultra Edge, whether it's um, Auto Noble, they 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 do go through all those processes thoroughly regularly um, by or by the elite umpires as well as the um, the international the umpires on the uh, ICC international uh, panel and even uh, for the SA20 uh, competition that was just concluded re recently prior to the competition the 12 umpires that officiated in the 
in the SA20 competition, we were also taken through um, our paces by one of the um, ICC umpire coaches, um, Carl Herter. Uh, Carl had uh, sessions with, um, with us, taking us through the technology, how the technology works, how ultra edge uh, works, how to interpret um, um, ultra edge, how to look at ultra edge, how DRS work. We went through thorough sessions leading up to to the SA20. So yes, there's, there's thorough training that gets done um, from ICC level to even um, provincial level while we did the SA20. Thanks, Tom, over. Thanks, Dula. Um, next one is a rebuttal from your previous answer about lunch being taken immediately when a innings ends in a one-day international. Uh, Gokul says that in the England versus New Zealand match in the 2015 World Cup, England were all out in the 31st over and New Zealand batted 10 minutes later uh, and they only took uh, the 40 or 30 minute interval uh, after New Zealand um, had batted for 10 overs. So I'm sure playing conditions have changed over the years, Dula. If you can just explain maybe how often playing conditions are reviewed and the fact that they can be different, you know, from one year to the next. Uh, yes, Tom, that was 2015, which was now uh, eight years ago. Playing conditions uh, gets uh, reviewed every single year. There is a, a, a committee uh, and uh, one one of our own, Adrian Olstock, is part of that committee uh, for the ICC. They regular, they sit yearly going through uh, the playing conditions and they also take feedback. There's actually a World uh, Cricket com uh, cricket Committee uh, where ex-players, uh, um, coaches, uh, umpires um, sit on. They also sit yearly and, and they do recommend uh, changes to the laws and playing conditions to the ICC. The ICC then take take that into uh, account when drawing up the playing conditions. Um, this particular playing condition, yes, it was in place in 2015 where uh, if, your, if the innings doesn't end within half an hour of the uh, scheduled uh, uh, um, cessation time of the first innings, um, the the um, side batting second, there will be a 10-minute change of innings interval. The side batting second will then bat up until the uh, um, scheduled cessation innings for uh, for the first, uh, first innings. They've then um, changed that um, due to input from captains. So now currently, the captains wanted if there's a if there is a innings ends early, they do not want to come back for for five, ten, twenty minutes, thirty minutes, or even an hour. They prefer to have their lunch immediately. That was a proposal from from the captains. It went to the World Cricketing Committee. They recommended it to the um, ICC committee that sits for the playing conditions. ICC committee was happy uh, with that recommendation. Though that's why currently, if innings ends, it doesn't matter if it's an hour, uh, two hours um, before the uh, scheduled cessation time, the uh, interval will be taken immediately. They've also added um, in the plan. In conditions, sometimes if you few run short of the target, uh, the the captain instead of taking the interval, the captain can, the captains can can decide. Yes, we want to play on. I'm just using it as an example where uh, every year they look at it, um, get the recommendations, playing change uh, if it makes uh, common sense and if the captains uh, wants it. Over Tom. Perfect. Thank you, Dula, for that thorough explanation. Next question is from Udaya Shankar. In a test match, already at 11 a.m., a team is nine wickets down. Uh, that's a very poor test match cricket nation if it's day one. Um, and the bowling team couldn't get the 10th wicket up until the scheduled lunchtime at 12. So will they still continue for another 30 minutes or will lunch be taken at the scheduled time of 12? 
uh, Abdullah, since I covered that in my laws, um, yes, Udaya Shankar, they will still play that extra 30 minutes or until the 10th wicket is taken. Uh, so it does not matter when the ninth wicket fell. It could have fallen at 10 in the morning if they were playing from the previous, if they were batting from the previous day. It could fall at 11.59. It could even fall at 12.01 in what is supposed to be the last over before lunch. Uh, if when you are supposed to call lunch at the end of the over that finishes at 12 or a little bit after 12, if there are nine wickets down, then you carry on for 30 minutes or until the 10th wicket is taken. Next comment is from Joseph saying that he is from uh, Pretoria playing for Hammanskral Cricket Hub and he is delighted to be part of this course. Uh, Joseph, tell all your clubmates that they should join. It's very good for players to know the laws of cricket. They can improve their performances through the knowledge of the laws. Next question is from Fazaj. During the bowling time, the batter has wicket, but the bowler is cross the head umpire. He cannot see if, if he is out. So what is that called? Out or not out? Or third umpire? Um, Abdullah, if I just think about this, I think Fasaj is referring to a bowler getting in front of the bowler's end umpire and the umpire is not able to see clearly to make a leg before wicket decision, for example. What do you do in that case? Thanks for your for your question. So when it comes to a leg before a decision, if the bowler is uh, obscured your view and you uh, you could not see um, uh, where the ball hit the batter, you couldn't see anything. And if there's an appeal, what should you do? Can you give the batter out or not? In this instance, you cannot give the batter out. You'll have to go not out. And you will have to tell the batter, uh, that uh, the bowler, that I'm giving a not out because you uh, you were running straight down and obscuring my view, so I was not able to to see um, where in relation to, to um, the stumps uh, when the ball hit the pad or where the pad was in relation to the stumps. So when it comes to an LBW appeal, you'll have to give it uh, a not out. If this was at the uh, uh, international game and there was DRS uh, uh, in place, you will, your decision will have to be not out. If they want to challenge it, they will, the fielding captain then has 15 seconds to tell, challenge your call, but from an umpiring point of view, LBW, polar obscuring, you cannot be guessing. If you didn't see where the the, um, the ball hit the pad in relation to the stumps, your answer, your answer to LBW appeal will have to be 100 out of 100 times not out. When it comes to a, a catch, then there are times where the bowler do obscure your view. Let's say the ball uh, um, gets edged and keep a diving in front of first slip or even the ball going to first slip or second slip and bowler obscuring your view. This is different. Yeah, the, um, the protocol is that you first consult with your strikers in umpire. Because you... You were obscured, your your vision was obscured by the bowler. You couldn't see whether it, it carried or not. And again, you're only going to consult whether it uh, carried or not. You're not going to ask strikers in whether there was an edge or not. You, your question uh, is that you definitely, you 100% sure there was an edge. Bowler obscured your view. You're not sure whether the ball carried or not. So first thing is you need to go to your strikers in umpire so you can call and signal dead ball, you um, consult your your, your strikers in umpire and um, he or she needs to confirm. Your question is, did the ball carry yes or no? If the answer to the question is yes, you give the, the striker out court. If the answer to it is no, 
you then say not out. Uh, if you if this is a televised game and you do have, have TV, then the protocols allows you to go upstairs. But the first thing that you need to do, you first consult it on field and you make a decision on field whether it's out or not out. And then you send it upstairs to the TV umpire with a soft signal of out or not out. And the TV umpire can then adjudicate whether, whether it's out or, or not out. Did I answer the question, Tom? Uh, 150%, uh, Tula. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Nilesh, I see your questions about Duckworth Lewis, but we have a question related to the bowler obstructing the umpire's view from Dehan. So I'm going to read it out for Abdullah to help us out with this one as well. Uh, in a previous last man standing umpiring experience, the bowler's follow through was not directly in front of me, but still obstructed my view of the wide line. As an umpire, can you ask the bowler to go wider or what should you do? Yeah, Diane, yes, those are difficult. Those are difficult and it happens from time to time where the bowler uh, do ob obscure your view. And uh, at times you're gonna, you um, at times I will say, um, go on what you see. If you didn't see the ball, if it's tight, if you didn't see the ball, go um, over the white line. You cannot call a white, but sometimes you can also use other clues that can that can assist you. But what what but uh, my advice to you is, if you if you didn't see it, go. Um, go over the line or let's say on the, for the right hand batter on the left hand side of the line and you didn't see it, it as being wide. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I would say do not call it, uh, but you can use other other clues. If there's other clues that can help you, sometimes you, you see you obscured, but you see the keeper taking the ball in front of, let's say, second slip. Uh, I mean, that is clearly true uh, for the ball to, to be taken in front of, uh, you know, sixth first or second slip, must really be a wide ball. Maybe take the, that clue into account and then call it, even though you didn't see it because the bowler obscured your view. Uh, but rather, if you didn't see it, uh, yeah, don't don't call it. To answer your question, whether you can ask the bowler to uh, to go to go wider, um, unfortunately not. I mean, the bowler is entitled to 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 bowl the line that the bowler feels uh, he, he or she wants for that particular delivery. If the bowler wants to come close to the stumps to to get an LBW um, uh, decision and and the bowler uh, do obscure your view, you cannot tell the bowler, no, bowler, you're obscuring my view. I cannot see uh, whether the ball was going wide or not. I need you to, to go wide. Unfortunately, you'll have to... Uh, the bowler is allowed to to bowl from how close or, or or how wide. It doesn't happen that often. It sometimes happens with the bowler obscures the view, but most of the time you do have a clear view of of where the ball goes. Uh, the odd occasion, uh, um, yes, the bowler do obscure your view. Now that's my viewpoint, Tom. I don't know if you wanna you have a different or you wanna add anything. Yeah, um, there is the protected area in the middle of the pitch. If the bowler is running on the protected area, then you will need to tell you him. It's part of your duties as an umpire. Uh, and there's a warning procedure for the bowler to not run in the protected area. Um, but if the bowler is not running in the protected area, then unfortunately you cannot tell him to run wider so that you can see uh, the wide line. Uh, what you can try and do is, is just move after the ball has been delivered and you can see that it's going wide and the batter is not playing at the stroke. For you to see if it's going over the wide line or not, you can try and move your head. Um, but that's a last resort. Uh, normally, as a bowler's end umpire, you stand still and your head must be especially still uh, for the duration of the delivery. Uh, but as Abdullah suggested, you can use other clues to help you make that decision. Um, one of the clues 
is often the bowler, the reaction of the bowler to that delivery will give you an idea if he thinks it's wide or not. You, we've got some uh, very, let's say, emotional fast bowlers who sometimes swear at themselves when they bowl a wide. So if a bowler is swearing at himself, then it's pretty good clue that the ball was wide of the wide line, even if you didn't see it. Um, but you can see the keeper moving over to collect the ball and the bowler swearing at himself, then um, then you can be pretty confident in calling that wide. Um, but yeah, you cannot, if the bowler is not running in the protected area, you cannot ask him or her to uh, run wider. Right, Dula, then we come to a couple of questions from Nilesh about the Duckworth, Lewis and Stern method of calculating uh, target scores in reduced matches. Uh, who does the DLS calculation as well as the net run rate calculation for both teams? It's obviously quite important for teams to know it and for that information to be readily available while play is going on. So, Nilesh, when it comes to DLS, it's the responsibility of the scorers. The umpires provide them with the relevant information. Overs build, uh, wickets taken, time we're restarting, all the info that they need uh, to punch into the DLS program. We, the umpires, provide them with that information. They then, they then uh, punch it in. Um, the, the program will then uh, provide us with the DLS uh, um, um, numbers. They print it for us and they bring it to the, the, the mass referee. And it's for the TV umpire to sign off or the third umpire to sign that off. The, um, only the mass referee is allowed a communication device um, in a televised uh, game as part of the ICC anti-corruption anti uh, uh, policy. So the mass referee will also just double check that the um, that his or her numbers uh, tie up with what the scorers has has uh, provided. But when it comes to DLS, the scorers, it's their responsibility. They provide us with the the numbers and the seats, actual physical uh, seats, which we hand. Um, to both uh, captains of both sides and um, the, the master referee will also keep a copy. Um, when it comes to uh, net, uh, net run rate and under the Cricket South Africa uh, uh, um, competitions, uh, we do have a, a statistician. Um, he is in charge of calculating uh, these, uh, these uh, numbers and he's the person, uh, he's, um, his name is Andrew Sampson. Um, he's the person that calculates uh, the, these numbers. And if net run rates needs to be, uh, we want to find out about anything about net run rates and team wants to know it, we contact him and he provides us with uh, those numbers. Not just us, uh, the, the teams as well, commentators, everyone gets the, the net run rate numbers from the uh, Cricket South Africa uh, statistician. Perfect, thanks, Tula. Follow on question from Nilesh. Why is Duckworth Lewis Stern used in white ball cricket but not uh, more day cricket um, like test matches? Do you know? I have no idea. Well, I've got an idea, but uh, let's get a technical answer from you. Please. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you, seeing that you're volunteering. Over to you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I think uh, test matches are over five days and uh, conditions change and we don't really know how much time we will have left in the game if it rains in day two and day three. Uh, we don't know if it's going to rain day four, or day five. Um, so Duckworth Lewis takes your resources available, your time remaining in the match when you have a interruption and 
then calculates a target based on uh, prior team A's run rate versus team B's run rate and how many overs they've got left. Uh, in test match cricket, when you've got two innings per sides and uh, a lot more time in the match than a 50 over match or a 20 over match, uh, those resources are very difficult to calculate in terms of wickets remaining, time remaining, and also uh, innings remaining. So yeah, just too many varying factors still in a four-day or five-day game versus a one-day game, Abdullah. That's the only reason I can come up with. No, I agree with you. That's exactly why why it's only in in white ball cricket. Thanks, Perfect. Tom. Thanks, Dula. Uh, uh, then Fazaj has got a very interesting uh, boundary catch scenario. Um, and it comes from the Big Bash League. I'm sure we all have seen that catch over the boundary line with a bit of a juggle. Uh, Fasaj, we will cover that in detail in Law 19 boundaries. And we have got that specific video that I'm sure you're talking about that we will uh, look at in detail. So please um, hold your question for next week, Wednesday, I think we will cover Law 19 and we can debate the whole night as to whether that should be six or should be out. Um, and we can also suggest any changes to that particular law because I think that particular catch had many people uh, arguing as to whether the law is um, a good law or needs reviewing. So thank you all very much for your questions and your interaction. I do not see any more questions in the chat box. I do not see any hands up uh, to open the floor to for more questions. So that will conclude our session for this evening. I will be sending out a recording of the lecture on YouTube later tonight. Um, again, if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, please do so because uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is you will be notified every time that we post a new video and we don't only post our lectures, we also have training that happens uh, every month at our monthly members meetings. And the second reason is that you get a discount for the exam fee, 50 Rand off your exam fee if you are South African or $3 off if you are a foreigner. So uh, do please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, Nilesh, uh, last question from you. What if a ball boy takes the ball in his hand before it reaches the fence? Is it a boundary or a dead ball? We will also deal with that in Law 19 next week, Wednesday. So please, guys, let's try keep the questions related to the material that we present. Um, and if we get to Law, uh, sorry, if we get to the sixth lecture, which is our final lecture, and we haven't covered something that came up in your head, uh, then we will take questions all night that night on anything cricket related. Thank you very much for your attendance. Have a good evening further and a good night for everyone. We will chat again on Monday. Have a great weekend when it comes. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.